Hello, welcome back. So now we're going on to diminishing marginal returns. And we just need to look at a couple of definitions here. So total product, this is the sum of the output from all the inputs. And the most important inputs we have are labor and capital. And by capital, we mean physical capital, like, you know, like plant and equipment or machines or something like that. Not, we're not talking here about money. And the average product, this is the, the total product divided by the quantity of a given input. So let's say the input is the number of laborers. So let's say a company, they're making tables and they make 20 tables. And let's say they've got four workers. So 20 divided by four is five. So the average product per worker is gonna be five tables. And then the marginal product, this is the amount of additional output resulting from using one more unit of input. So it's, we can say how much more output is there if we add one more worker. And now we also assume here that other inputs are fixed. So all we do is we take the change in quantity by the change in the number of L is the labor, like the number of laborers. And so when we see the word marginal, we must always think to ourselves, one more. And then marginal product usually increases as the first units of an input are added. So this means that the next worker that's being added in the, in the start, he adds more than the previous worker did. So he makes more, he adds more than the previous worker added. But here comes the but. But as input quantities are increased, at some point, adding one more unit of one more input will actually increase total product by less than the addition of the previous input. So what happens uh, at some stage is that the next guy who joins, he adds less output than the previous guy did. So and this is called the point of diminishing marginal returns. So output is increasing but at a decreasing rate. So output is increasing, which means our total product here is going up, but it's increasing at a decreasing rate. Right. So now we need to look at break even and shutdown analysis. And also we need to start off with a few definitions here. So our average total costs, it's, it's nice and easy to work out. All we do is we take our total costs and we divide by the total output. So the total costs, they can be broken down into fixed costs and variable costs. So our average fixed cost, we just take the total fixed costs and we divide that by the total output. So our, our fixed costs are things like rent, you know, whether we make one table or a thousand tables, the rent remains the same. And then the variable, average variable costs, we just take our total variable costs and divide that by the total output. So our variable costs are things that change as our, as our output changes. So for example, our materials when we make the tables. So the more tables we make, the more wood and whatever we need to make the tables. So our variable costs there will go up as our output increases. So our, our total costs then, is gonna be the sum of the fixed costs and the variable costs. And then the marginal cost, this is the addition to total cost of producing one more unit. So remember marginal always one more. So to work it out, all we do is we take the change in total cost divided by the change in the quantity or the output. So let's say output increases from 10 to 12 units and the total cost that goes up from $80 to $90. So what's the marginal cost? Nice and easy. We just take the increase in costs, it's, it's $10, and we've got two extra units there, the change in quantity, the change in the, in the output is two units. So that gives us a marginal cost of $5 per unit. And then we can see here that the marginal cost curve, it intersects the average variable cost and the average total cost, uh, average total cost curves at their minimum points. And we'll see this now on the next slide when we look at the diagrams. But just before we get there, when the marginal cost 
is below the average total cost and the average variable cost. It actually brings the average total cost and average variable cost down, which makes a lot of sense. And the best way to understand it is if we think of a cricketer, and let's say his average, his test average is 50. So now let's say his next innings, his marginal innings, he goes in and he makes 10 runs, right? So his marginal innings, he has below his average, it's going to put his average down. But if he goes into batting and makes 100, okay, good for him, well done. So now his marginal innings, it's above the average here, so it's going to pull the average up. Okay, so that is a good way to understand it. And we are going to look at the diagrams, as we said, on the next slide. And we're also going to see on the next slide that the average total cost and average variable cost curves, they are U-shaped. So the decline initially, which is good news because we see the costs going down as output goes up initially, but then they start increasing due to those diminishing returns. And just before we get to the next slide, we've got to look at a, a, another definition, which is economic profit. So economic profit is equal to total revenue minus economic cost. So let's just stop there for a minute, because when we do financial reporting in the next section, we're going to be spending, you know, we're going to be looking at accounting profit. And of course, what is accounting profit? Accounting profit is total revenue minus accounting costs or, or accounting expenses. Now you see economic costs is different they don't subtract accounting costs, they subtract economic costs. Now, economic costs includes everything. It includes the accounting costs, but they also take um, opportunity costs into account. So economic costs don't only include accounting costs, they include opportunity costs as well. So what is the opportunity cost? Uh, opportunity cost is the next best alternative for gone in making a decision. So we could ask questions like, you know, what else could the plant and equipment have been used for? So of course, an accountant will never take opportunity costs into account. An accountant will just take total revenue minus accounting costs. But economists, they take not only the accounting costs into account, but also these opportunity costs, which becomes the all of the all of the all of them are the economic costs so the economic profit then is different to the accounting profit right so we're now going to look at the scenario first of all under perfect competition we're going to be doing this in the next reading perfect competition and we're going to see there that in the scenario under the structure we sell all goods at the same price and if we sell all goods at the same price, the, the price is going to equal average revenue because everything's sold at the same price. And it'll also equal marginal revenue because marginal re revenues, what do we get from selling the next unit? And if we, if we sell every unit at the same price, that means that the marginal revenue is the same as the price. And if we look at the curves here that we discussed on the previous slide, we can see that the average total cost curve is here. It's the highest one because it's got the highest costs, of course. And it's got the U-shape and the average variable costs over here. So we said that when the marginal cost curve here, when the marginal costs are below the average total costs, or I mean, a bigger part, this is the average variable, variable cost. Let me say it again. When the marginal costs are below the average variable costs, remember, it pulls the average down. But when the, when the marginal costs here start rising above the average variable cost, it pulls the average variable cost up. And the same with average total cost. So when the marginal costs here are below the average total cost, it, it, it pulls the average down. But when the marginal costs start going higher than the average, in the average, average total cost, it pulls the average total cost up. Okay, so that's what we saw on the previous slide. So now we've got to know under perfect competition, different, what would the situation be if we use different prices? So if the price that the goods are being sold at are above P1, so example, the prices are up here. Now remember price and, and average revenue are the same. So the price and the average revenue are the same. So if the, we can just say now that the, the average revenue if this is the case, is above average total cost. So the revenue is above cost. So of course, this is now we've got profits, but we've got these what we call economic profits. They are now 
greater than zero. So of course, we must operate in the short run and the long run. But what happens is, is if we over here, that the price is equal to P1. So the price is, the price is over here at P1, we can see what happens. The, we, we're breaking even because the price is the same as the average total cost. This is the average total cost here. So the price, uh, the price or the average revenue is the same as the, as the total costs. So we, the, the economic profit is zero. But we must always remember that economic profit is zero, but there's still normal, we can call it normal accounting profits because the accountants don't take into these opportunity costs into account. So as far as accounting profit goes, there still will be accounting profits, but they are not economic profits, right? And now what happens if the price is between here, between P1 and P2? Now we can see the average total cost is above the average revenue because average revenue is here now the price. Now the costs are above the price because we either price is down here. And, but at least, one good thing, the average revenue, which is also the price, so let's put a P there, the average revenue is the price, that is at least that is above average variable costs. So, because average variable costs are there, so at least the price is above the average variable costs. So we're going to operate in the short run because we are covering some of the fixed costs, but we will shut down in the long run. And then what happens lastly, if the price is below P2? Well, if the price is below P2 somewhere here, this is very bad news because now the price, which is the average revenue, is even below our average variable costs over here. So we should then shut down in the short run and in the long run. Right, and then what about under imperfect competition? Now we'll see later on when we get to the next reading that under imperfect competition, price and average revenue are not the same. So this is the, what we need to do. If total revenue is, where, when total revenue is equal to our total costs, that's our break even quantity. And then we're gonna operate in both the short run and the long run, because we are making accounting profits, even though we economic profits are we breaking even. And then what happens in this situation where total costs are greater than total revenue, it's not looking good because our costs are, are greater than our revenue. But if the revenue, total revenue is at least greater than our total variable costs, then we operate in the short run, but we shut down in the long run. So I just put some numbers to it over here. So let's say our total costs are 100, total revenue is 80, it's not great because our costs exceed the revenue, but at least the revenue is greater than the total variable costs then so we're going to at least we can sh operate in the sh short run but shut down in the long run so remember we said earlier that our total costs is the sum of the fixed costs and the variable costs so if our total costs are 100 and our variable costs are 60 that means our fixed costs must be 40. and then lastly when our total revenue is less than the total variable cost so now i've made the total revenue very bad I've made it less even than the total variable cost. I've made it 40. So if, if that's the case, we should definitely shut down in the short run and in the long run. Yeah. And then this is our last slide for this class. So we're now looking at the economies and the diseconomies of scale. So the, the, the SAT is the short run average total cost curves. They represent different plant sizes which are these different short in the short run the plot the, the plant sizes are fixed they're fixed in the short run so this is short run average total cost curve one for example and we could have many many more but i just drew in four over here and then we can see here this is the long run average total cost curve and we can see that each point along the long run average total cost point the long run average total cost curve is where the short run average total cost curve is at its minimum right so so every time so, so the long run curve is just the the points where all the short run curves are at the minimum so we just do join we just connect all of those so we can see that the size of the firm uh, 
it's variable in the long run. Okay, so the, the, the firm, the size of the firm is fixed in the short run, or the plant size is fixed in the short run, but in the long run, it is variable. So um, the economies of scale, this is good, because we see what happens with economies of scale. We've got like efficiencies, like labor efficiencies, or um, equipment efficiencies or something like that. So there's specialization um, efficiencies. So how else can this, how else can we get these economies of scale? We can be, they can be gained, get, we can get them from bargaining power in input prices or by mass producing or by having tech, technology efficiency, something like that. So we can see that 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 um, we we reduce when we, when we have economies of scale, as we make more, the costs come down. Eh? So we can see there how the costs come down, and then we get eventually to the minimum efficient scale, which is the best because the optimal firm size here, because our cost per unit are the lowest at this point. Okay, but when our costs start going up as we make more like here, this is what we call diseconomies of scale. And how can this happen? So it can happen from bureaucratic and communication breakdowns. Um, it can happen from supply constraints where we got to now increase our input prices, which is which is not good news, or the firm can get become too large to be managed pro properly. So what they say, if we've got diseconomies of scale, we should actually, we should actually go this way. Hey, we should actually reduce, we should actually reduce um, output so we can move back to the minimum efficient scale, which is the best optimal firm sales. But when we've got economies of scale, then we should expand production. So when we've got economies of scale, we should expand production so that we can move to the minimum efficient scale. Excellent. So that's the end of that reading. Uh, we'll see you guys in the next class when we move on to the next reading. And just remember, uh, study hard, practice those questions. And if you've got any questions for me, please let me know and we'll assist you. Okay, so we'll see you guys in the next class. Hello, it's Tim here again. I hope you enjoyed the class and found it beneficial. We have some classes available for free on YouTube, but we have classes for the entire curriculum. The classes that are not on YouTube can be purchased from us. If you'd like to purchase the classes, please contact us for the pricing, and I've put our contact details over here. You can purchase all the classes or certain readings that you would like. When you purchase the classes, we provide you with the slides and our notes. I've assisted hundreds of candidates pass CFA exams, and I look forward to also helping you through the CFA program. I've put in two testimonials in the slide over here, and we also have a testimonials page at, on our website that you can review. I look forward to seeing you soon, and all the best.